I've now been off work for 100 days. This is the 13th video that we've made at home about anatomy topics. I'm kind of running out of topics to talk about, but I thought we'd talk about the auditory tube, pharyngotympanic tube, eustachian tube, which are all the same thing. Um, because I've talked about the anatomy of the ear before, but this is a particular structure that people kind of tend to be aware of. It's some really interesting anatomy. It's useful for people that are studying anatomy, but that are also a whole bunch of kind of like really cool layman's facts associated with it. It's about, what, 35 millimeters long? But it's um, really important. The anatomy of the ear. So how does the ear work? Well, essentially you've got an eardrum, right? The tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane vibrates as the air vibrates. And those vi vibrations are conducted, transduced, the pressure waves are moved along until eventually they can be detected by the deflection of hair cells. Now, of course, that eardrum, like a drum, works better if the air pressure is equal on both sides. Physicists may well correct me on that, but um, certainly in our ear, the middle ear space is deep to the tympanic membrane and the outer ear space is is superficial to it, external to it. And the, the middle ear is an air-filled chamber and the pressure inside that air-filled chamber may not be the same as the air pressure outside. And the tympanic membrane is so sensitive to pressure that you can feel changes in the tympanic membrane as you drive up and down a hill, as you go up and down in a plane, as you, as you change very little external air pressure. So the crux idea here is then that as the air pressure outside the ear changes, we should be able to change the pressure inside the middle ear. So the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane is about the same. If the pressure is greater one way or the other, we can feel the tympanic membrane stretching. It's incredibly sensitive. And it's the auditory tube that is responsible for connecting the middle ear space to the outside air. And it actually does that inside your nasopharynx, right, deep in there, because you've got an air cavity in there, air cavity in there. So that air cavity links to the middle ear through the auditory tube. Um, and it's, as I say, it's got three names. So your station tube is most common surgical name, so that's named after its uh, originator. Um, the auditory tube is a sensible name, but the pharyngotympanic tube anatomically tells you where it goes to and from. It runs between the tympanic membrane and the pharynx. You can use any of those three names, I don't mind. I tell my students that eustachian tube is really hard to spell correctly, but nonetheless that's the one they tend to go for. In exam questions for some reason. Right, now structure. Okay, so much of the middle ear, inner ear structures are bony. They're parts of the bony base of the skull, which is gonna lead us to another interesting layman's idea and things that films get wrong later. Um, so that's the external ear there, tympanic membrane, the middle ear, and then the auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube its lateral third then is largely a bony tube. That's kind of how it starts, how it runs from the middle ear space. And then it becomes a cartilaginous tube for its medial two thirds. Um, and that cartilaginous tube is a little bit soft and flexible, which means most of the time it's actually, it kind of, it's kind of shut. It sits shut because it's a flexible tube. Now the inside of the pharyngotympanic tube is lined with a mucous membrane, like much of um, the upper respiratory tract. And I think much, part of it is even a ciliated um, epithelium because that cilia can be damaged by smoking and what have you and cause other problems. Anyway, so the cartilaginous part of the auditory tube can collapse on itself and actually should collapse on itself. And that's a normal thing and the mucous membranes then lie against each other and the auditory is, tube is closed. So there isn't a constant opening between the nasopharynx and the middle ear uh, normally. In some people there is, we'll come back to that later. So how do you then equalize the pressure in your middle ear um, when you go up and down hills, when you're on a plane and that sort of thing? We well, already know, don't you? 
you swallow. So, um, I remember when the kids were small and we went on planes, you'd always give them like a boiled sweet and then watch them like a hawk, make sure they didn't choke on it, or a chewy sweet or something. Um, because when you have something like a sweet in your mouth, you have to keep swallowing the saliva and the dissolving sweet, don't you? And it's that swallowing action that opens the nasopharyngeal end of the auditory tube. Too many names. Um, so the um, muscles of the soft palate, tensor veli palatini and levator veli palatini, both attach to the, the nasopharyngeal opening end of the auditory tube, which gets called the salpinx. Which is like, uh, there was a long, it's a long like trumpet type Greek instrument from where ago. Anyway, um, so when you swallow and you move the soft palate during that swallowing action, you move the muscles of the soft palate, those other ends then tug on the opening of the auditory tube and tug it open. So that collapsed cartilaginous tube is then pulled open briefly. And during that brief opening, then air can move in or out, whatever needs to happen. And the pressure in the middle ear is then equalized to the pressure um, outside the body and the tympanic membrane is happy again. You can also do the same thing with, uh, with yawning um, when I'm snorkeling and I dive down deep, the, so then, then there's, there's a big pressure outside. So if you just go down like, you know, a couple of meters, um, the pressure of water outside the ear is really, really high. So then you squeeze your nose and you have your mouth closed and you push air out into the head space and you're actually pushing air into the auditory tube and into the middle ear. So you're increasing the pressure inside that middle ear space to try to match the water pressure outside so the tympanic membrane isn't being squashed. Because it hurts, right? It hurts when you go down deep. So you increase the pressure inside your mid middle ear, stops being hurting. Okay, what about blood supply? Right, well, think about where we are. We're outside the cranial cavity. Um, we're in kind of deep face, pretty much. So the blood supply to the auditory tube is essentially from the external carotid artery. We have the maxillary artery, that will give off a number of branches to it. We have the middle meningeal artery, that will supply some blood to it. There's an ascending pharyngeal artery. All of those will supply blood to the tube as it passes. And of course, remember, it's running from essentially the ear region to the pharynx region. So as it runs, it's gonna meet different regions of the face, even though it's only running a short distance. So it's gonna pick up different blood vessels in different regions. It drains blood then to the pterygoid venous plexus. We talked about that the other week when we were talking about blood draining from the orbit. The pterygoid venous plexus is a plexus of deep veins in the, in the deep face. Innovation, um, laterally, because it's at the middle ear, we have the tympanic plexus there which is largely uh, fibres from the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, and we've got sympathetic fibres in there and what have you as well. So certainly laterally tympanic plexus. Then it as it moves medially, it's going to get close to the pterygopalatine ganglion. Have we done all four parasympathetic ganglia of the head now? If we have, they're fun. Um, so the pterygopalatine ganglion then is largely formed by branches of the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. And if you think that um, the auditory tube is lined by a mucous membrane, then there's gonna be parasympathetic innervation for um, mucus secretion, and there's gonna be sympathetic innervation for control of blood flow. Lymphatic drainage, deep cervical lymph nodes. Okay, so that's that's the anatomy of the eustachian tube, pharyngeotympanic tube, auditory tube. More than anybody needs to know, but that's the stuff that's written down in the textbooks. The really important stuff is the concept, what it does, where it runs from, and two, and probably the most important reason for that is ear infections. How on earth do you get an ear infection in your middle ear if there's a tympanic membrane separating the middle ear from the outside? Well, it's through the auditory tube, isn't it? So upper respiratory tract infections can pass along the auditory tube up into the middle ear space. And that's the cause, the most common source of 
of ear infections. So then that infection is sat in that lovely, nice, warm, comfortable mucous membrane lined space of the middle ear and it gets going and going and going. And of course, as it grows and produces pus and all sorts of horrible things, it builds pressure and pain on the tympanic membrane. Now, supposedly, um, the reason ear infections are more common in children is because that auditory tube is shorter and more horizontal, so it's easier for an infection to track along it. Um, there's a little bit of debate around that. It might be just that kids are more prone to infections. Um, as you get older and become an adult, your auditory tube will run at a little bit of a bit of an angle. It is a crucial piece of anatomy in understanding ear infections. Um, the other one I like though is films. Films are weird, you know, like somebody gets stabbed in the eye and they drop dead. Somebody gets stabbed in the ear and they drop dead. And anatomically, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, sure, if you stab somebody, you've got to go a really long way back. And then you think with the frontal lobes up here. And when, anyway, if you think about your actual anatomy. So now you know about the auditory tube, a penetrating injury to the external auditory meatus, where is it actually going to go? Is it going to go into the brain? Well, look at the skull. Look at where the ear apparatus is. Okay, you might say external auditory meatus, internal auditory meatus, and so on. But actually, the structure of the ear is contained within the petrous part of that temporal bone. It's a thick, rocky bone-ish, as long as you poke in the right direction. And because it's really in the base of the skull, um, injuries tend to actually get deflected more along the root of the auditory tube which means that they tend to go into the nasopharynx so a penetrating injury to the ear doesn't instantly kill somebody it usually leaves somebody with something stuck in their ear going ow and a final very rare thing but it's quite interesting is a, a patulus um, auditory tube or patulous eustachian tube because it's usually surgeons that are describing these things um, in that that eustachian tube is supposed to close it's closed in most of us that's normal but in some people it stays open and that can have different ranges of effects but it seems to create a weird echo like um, the sound of your own breathing the sound of your own voice inside your own head and not in the normal way that you're experiencing but kind of in an echoing way so, um, and like I say, it affects different people differently, but if the auditory tube stays open, then that can have some strange effects on sound. Hmm. Anyway, that's it. The auditory tube, eustachian tube, pharyngotympanic tube, um, the anatomy of where it runs to and from, that's the important bit, and its function, and then that idea of ear infection. Those are the most important concepts to hold on to. All right, there's 13 videos in my back garden. I'm gonna to have to buy some plastic models at this rate if we stay locked down much longer. But I don't know where I'm gonna put them. Right, see you next week.